Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you so much for being here. Uh, my name is Carrie Salerno. I am with the City of Philadelphia's um, Office of Public Safety. Um, I first want to thank um, Philadelphia Fight for not only having this, this summit today, um, I attended a couple of sessions um, this morning and also this afternoon and really enjoyed myself, met a lot of amazing people and learned a lot. So thank you not only for doing the summit but also especially for allowing us the opportunity to do this panel about Ban the Box. It is um, an important issue that has been a hot topic in Philadelphia for a really long time. I want to thank many organizations that worked for a number of years to get this legislation passed in City Council. In order to start us out, to get you guys a lot of great um, information and a good introduction to what Ban the Box is, why it is important that it was passed, how it got passed, and then what it means right now is there are a couple of great students at Penn Law that did a video that documented this whole process. So without further ado. I have put in hundreds of applications. I've gone on numerous interviews. I did go on an interview and everything was going well with the interview but the woman came out and she happened to see the sheet that said have you ever been convicted and when I put yes and I explained in loose terms what happened her response to me before I even got the interview she was like Shana you know we really had something for you you know we knew we could have really used you but you know we have a protocol and our protocol doesn't allow us to hire people with the background. My talking is Isaac Blackstone, Faith, uh-huh, yeah, okay, this is on the If we got to the box, you know, just hold the meeting chains. I'm trying to get the folks probably filthy as grimy, stinkiest job you were getting for the lowest pay. And you told me I'm not giving up for that. I'm not giving up for being the tall because they have a the record. Across the country, individuals are routinely asked to check a box on job applications indicating whether they've been arrested or convicted of a crime. Every day, the applications of countless qualified job seekers who check that box are immediately thrown into the trash by employers. The number of people across the country affected by this practice is staggering. About 65 million U.S. adults have been arrested or convicted of a crime. That's more than one in four Americans. A movement to help the formerly convicted get a fair chance at employment is sweeping the country. Hawaii, New Mexico, Minnesota, Connecticut, and Massachusetts all have banned the box. Five other states have proposed similar laws. And more than 25 cities across the U.S. have enacted this protection. On March 31, 2011, Philadelphia joined this movement by banning the box on most private and public employment applications. City Councilwoman Donna Reed Miller introduced this legislation. We always thought that if we could get that question off and give people an opportunity to talk about who they are, their knowledge, skills, and abilities, then they could have a better chance of obtaining employment. The employer is not permitted to ask in their application whether an individual was arrested or convicted of any offense, nor is the employer permitted to make any personal inquiries, and an inquiry could be an internet search, a criminal background check, until after the employer has conducted at least one interview. Ban the box legislation is an important step, but more is needed. This problem goes beyond the initial application. We call this ban the box not just a legislation, but it's a movement. It's a social movement. It's going to have impact on families, have impact on poverty, and it's going to have impact on the recidivist rate. So in the past three decades or so, there has been this incredible growth in the criminal justice system. The number of people that are incarcerated has grown roughly sevenfold, so there are now more than two million people behind bars, and nearly 700,000 people that are being released each year from prison. Pennsylvania is the leading state in locking people up, so unfortunately uh, we have many folks that are affected by uh, uh, this, this bill and this problem. Just here in the city of Philadelphia, you have 300,000 
formerly convicted people. 200,000 no longer on probation or parole. They may have been crime free for 5, 10, 15, 20, 40 years. In the incarceration process, you have the audacity to use my body to do work. Like going to North Carolina, you work at the state building, you work on the highway, and things of this nature, and then when you come home, you can't even get a job to pay that. Criminal records issues is one of, if not the largest barrier to employment to low wage workers now in Philadelphia. In the 11 years I've been at CLS, the number of cases of people coming in with criminal records related issues has tripled. More people get probation than incarceration, okay? And people who receive probation are faced with the exact same discrimination that people who get incarcerated. We see a lot of people who come to us and say, we had an easier time getting employment right out of prison 15 years ago than we are right now. That is because employers are using criminal background checks on a routine basis. You go on the internet, and you see all these things, background check, this, that, and the other thing. It's so easy to, to, to look up somebody's record, and it's oftentimes not accurate at all. Many times we notice there's missing date of birth, social security numbers, so it's the wrong person, but a similar name, and employers are making decisions based on this, which is a real problem. Criminal background checks typically report anything that is in a person's history, even arrests, which are not proven criminal activity, but are just, you know, the suspicion of criminal activity. Once the person hit the yes box, nine times out of ten, they don't get called or they don't get an interview. I was convicted of a crime 32 years ago, found not guilty and it's still affecting my life. No employment, it's just rough. It's been rough. And that's, I think that's a long time to hold something against a person. Without a doubt, there are people who are convicted of a crime who, who didn't do it. There are even people who plead guilty to a crime who didn't do it. There are a lot of reasons people plead guilty. Sometimes it's easier just to say you're guilty than to fight the crime, especially when you don't have a lot of money. And therefore, you get something on your record, you don't go to jail, and you think, this isn't going to hurt me. It could very well be that the person just wasn't going to fight it, because if you go before a jury, you can get into even bigger trouble. So you have to keep an open mind. Mm -hmm. They want to play to it because the district attorney is offering a probation sentence or, or, or maybe a fine only, and they want to get this over with. They always want to get it over with and get on with their lives. And they don't really stop to think about the, the implication of it that you're going, to, you're going to travel through the rest of your life with this record. In Pennsylvania, a conviction stays on an individual's record forever. People can apply for pardons down the line. They usually have to wait five years after a misdemeanor conviction, probably ten years after a felony conviction, and pardons are not guaranteed. The pardon process is very difficult in Pennsylvania. I think that that's probably true throughout the country. Um, it takes anywhere from two to three years for the process to conclude, and only several hundred people out of several thousand people that have applied for a pardon receive that pardon. The problem of hiring restrictions on formerly convicted people disproportionately affects people who are poor because 80% of criminal defendants are low income. The problem is exacerbated if you're a minority because minorities are disproportionately impacted at all stages of the criminal justice process. First, you're more likely to be stopped if you're a minority. Second, you're more likely to be arrested. Third, you're more likely to be held without bail or have a bail that's too high. Fourth, you're more likely to be convicted, and then you're more likely to go to prison. Uh, there is a disproportionate impact right through the system. So I've conducted a series of field experiments in which I've hired groups of young men to pose as job applicants and send them all over the city applying for real low-wage jobs. 
with resumes that reflect identical levels of education and work experience. Within each team, I randomly assign a criminal record to one applicant for the first set of job searches and then have that team switch off. And so we find that across the board, a criminal record is incredibly um, debilitating. Applicants with a criminal record are about half as likely to receive a callback or job offer relative to equally qualified non-offenders. Some of the findings in my research that were most surprising had to do with just the effects of racial discrimination um, independent of the issue of criminal records. So a black applicant with no criminal background fared no better than a white applicant just out of prison. So race is one of those characteristics that employers seem to use as a proxy for employability. That then combined with a criminal record seems to intensify the stigma and basically eliminates virtually all possibilities of employment for that group of people. While well, lawmakers and advocates in Philadelphia are fighting for necessary protections beyond ban the box, there already exist basic restrictions on how employers may consider an applicant's criminal record. Basically, Title VII has been interpreted to require an employer, if they're going to use a criminal record, to look at the nature and gravity of the offense, how much time has passed since the conviction or incarceration, with the nature of the job. Throughout my, uh, my involvement through the expungement process, it is clear that employers are violating that law. Employers in Pennsylvania also routinely violate state law, which similarly limits employers to considering only those convictions that are job related. This means that a sex offense would restrict you from working with children, but it wouldn't categorically prohibit you from all forms of employment. A drunk driving conviction may be related to a job as a truck driver, but not as a secretary. Even though um, I had a criminal um, conviction, I never was fired from my job. They allowed me to continue to work, and the sentence allowed me to serve the 30 days on the weekends. The downsizing um, of my company was the reason why I got laid off, not um, anything due to my conviction. Um, my conviction and the crime was in 2001 and 2002. I was not released from my job until 2009. The conviction has been the hindrance for me finding a job at this time. Um, I can still clearly um, get an interview, but um, at that point they will have you fill out an application and at that same time they're asking for you to um, give permission to run a background check. And usually after that point in which they run the background check, then I'm disqualified from um, being applicable for that position. To forever foreclose a permissible means of gainful employment because of an improvident act in the distant past completely loses sight of any concept of forgiveness for prior errant behavior and adds yet another stumbling block along the difficult road of rehabilitation. And not only do we talk about rehabilitation, but also we're talking about funds and taxes and money and public safety. All of those aspects are intertwined in this issue, and that's why it's such an important civil rights issue. Felony convictions um, trigger a wide range of legal and social um, restrictions. It affects uh, not only one's ability to, to become employed, but that has a kind of a ripple effect. When individuals do not get a fair chance, they cannot provide for their families. They cannot afford safe housing and struggle to afford food, clothing, and other basic necessities. Barred from public housing, their family may be split apart. With no hope and diminished self-esteem, these individuals are more likely to end up abusing alcohol or other substances, or getting caught back up in criminal activity. In fact, 65% of those who don't find employment within three years of returning to society end up back in the criminal justice system. The population of Philadelphia is about 1.5 million. One-fifth of our population, about 300,000 individuals, have records. And if each of these individuals is responsible for just one person, whether a spouse, a child, or a parent, that 300,000 becomes 600,000. That's almost half the city's population. The effects of prohibiting just one person from getting a job are exponential. I couldn't, you know, get a job. And they, they, they broke me real, they broke me down. 
because I couldn't take care of my family. I couldn't be a husband. I couldn't be a father. And everything came down on me. And I wound up getting divorced. I became homeless. I lost my wife, my family. I lost everything. A mother who has three children yeah, you know, it is not able to afford a safe environment for her children, and tries to apply for safe public housing, and is rejected because of her conviction. Where is that person supposed to go then? Now you done subjected the children that had nothing to do with anything. Now you done subjected them to a lifelong life of poverty because of something that their father or their mother may have done. I got so frustrated, I started to drink. And, and, and that didn't help. It takes away the pain of not being employed. You don't have to think about it for a little while, but reality sets in soon, you know, and then you continue the next day doing the same thing to escape reality. It works with your self-esteem. It works with your ego. You know, a lot of people, I find myself depressed a lot. Pre depressed, I'm angry, I'm frustrated. Because I'm trying so hard just to get back, to get my foot in the door. One of the strongest predictors of desistance from crime or moving away from a life of crime is finding quality, steady employment. Someone that committed a crime and has been crime-free for seven years is less likely to offend than someone that has not committed a crime at all. So the ex-offenders that are able to find jobs are much less likely to engage in crime, to be arrested or be incarcerated. What is happening in our society is that we've got this class of individuals who, because they've made a mistake, maybe a couple of mistakes, are forever being banned and restricted from employment. I mean, and people that I don't think really stop to understand how that system really kind of sets you up for failure and sets you up to become that self-fulfilling prophecy of an ex, an, uh, you know, offending again. In order to feed their families, they have to be able to have a job, have to be able to make money. And if they can't get a job, then they're going to resort to other, other means to get that money. And in a lot of times, it, it leads right back to crime. And I think we as a society believe in redemption, we believe in second chances, and yet some of these collateral consequences that we attach to criminal records means that once you've made a mistake, you will never have an opportunity to get beyond that mistake. When people say that you paid your debt to society, you paid your debt. If I borrowed $5 from Wayne and I paid him back, he's not looking at me like, oh, you still owe me money. I paid my debt. And you got to look at this situation the same way. People have paid their debt. We have to be serious about second chances. It is to the betterment of this whole city that everybody get a fair and equal opportunity towards work. Where do you think this tax money is going to? If we don't find other ways in which to employ and educate people that have been, have gone down that wrong path from, from the beginning, if we fail to do that, it's only gonna become more expensive. And we're paying for it. I am trained as an administrative assistant. I'm a chess player, so I've taught chess to kids. I was an executive assistant to the director at the Wharton School. I worked in a barber shop. I put myself to school for medical billing. I worked for Pennsylvania School for the Deaf. Which is shop. I was an office manager. Human services for 17 years. I feel that my resume is impressive. I have a lot of experience behind me, and I'm good at what I do. So I'm good at what I do. I just need the opportunity to be able to deliver what I know. There are employers in Philadelphia who already recognize the skills and commitment that the formerly convicted can contribute to the workplace. As far as we're concerned, um, our employment pool is that two-mile circle around our stores. If there's Muslim people, we hire the Muslim people. If there's uh, African-American people, we hire African-American people. If there's ex-offenders, we hire ex-offenders. Those are our customers, and therefore they should be our associates. We would not exclude someone unless it was job related. Right. And that's what the state law is. Our, our position always has been is we want to hire the best available candidate. And that person may or may not have a conviction. I think we just think it's very important to give people a chance at employment when they paid their debt to society. If we have unemployed ex-offenders surrounding Temple, how is that going to help our neighborhood? You know, you get paid back tenfold in 
in the community, people all recognize what we do for them and therefore they spend their money here. And if you're an employer that jumps on board and says, you know what, if I'm going to make this area a better place, a safer place, a more well-rounded community, you know, you got to fix the problem. And the problem is, is if a person can just can't get a job ever, they're really left to the only alternative is to do illegal things. A lot of employers, they find that these are people who really want to work. They're very committed to the jobs that they get. They feel very thankful that they've been able to get a job. That's the first thing people say about formerly convicted people is that you can't now work. Given the opportunity, they will rise to the occasion. And I mean, we've had employees here. The same thing is, is true. The two people who run our re-entry programs had served time in prison. I and mean, they are just wonderful people. They bring such a wonderful background to this work. They really do an impressive job. We find success with it because we have people that, that really, they just show such appreciation. They come ready to work. They come with the right attitude. These employers also find that many of the common fears about liability for hiring the formerly convicted are unfounded. And when you hire anyone, you you know, what they did before may or may not be a good indicator of what's going to happen. Anybody, whether they have a criminal background or not, could potentially do something that's not right. A common misconception about the Van the Box initiative is that it gives the formerly convicted an unfair advantage. It's not saying that employers should actively recruit or hire ex-offenders um, ahead of people that have not gotten a conviction on their record. It's just saying in the initial stage of the employment process, um, we might want to view these applicants equally. For us, it doesn't really become an issue um, that somebody would say, well, it's unfair that you're giving an ex-offender a leg up. I mean, we're really not. We're just saying we're open to all people. That's all we're saying. And I've seen so many people who come out of prison who really do want to make a change. They may have been violent years ago and could have been an alcoholic or something drinking, and now they clean and sober and, you know, just want to live their life. They could have been without children then. Now they're more responsible adults at this time. When do you say, okay, you know what, we've punished this person enough, let's give them that chance. I think everybody deserves a fair shot at a job. During the filming of this documentary, Leroy Brown overcame the obstacles to employment that he had faced for years and founded his own recovery house in North Philadelphia. I was addicted to drugs and um, it took a while for me to come out of it. And then and when I did, I, I ran into a lot of problems. I ran into a lot of problems over it. I couldn't afford housing, so I had to live in a recovery house. So once I got the opportunity, to get out and to do something on my own, but then I took that opportunity and I want to try to, to have the best transitional house. I want to have a nice place for people to live in and feel feel welcome, feel at home. I want them to, to have, a, have a better place than I had, you know. I would, I would love to see people be a little more open-minded and kind and charitable when it comes to our fellow citizens and especially those who may have had a difficult time and may have become involved with the law. There's always a good chance that they are at a point in their lives where they, they really want to turn things around.
some answers for everyone. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is just want to ask that each panelist just very briefly, you know, say your name and your organization. Again, uh, once again, my name is Carrie Salerno. I'm with the Public Safety Office with the City of Philadelphia. Excuse me. My name is Ruben Jones, and I'm Executive Director of Frontline Dads. My name is Kay Yu, and I'm the Chairperson of the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations. My name is Wallace Custis, and I'm the Manager of Training for the Mayor's Office for Renovative Services for Ex Offenders. Great, thank you all so much. Um, I, Ruben, I know that you were very, very involved with um, the, the Ban the Box campaign and getting the passage and the making the documentary. Um, is, there, is there anything um, in addition that you want to sort of talk about um, getting the legislation passed, making of the film? Um, I just want to say that for Full Off to be kind of at the cut edge of this kind of legislation, because it's, as they mentioned in the documentary, there's only about 25 other cities around the country. Um, and it's growing, it's a growing movement, but for me, this, this issue is at the heart of, when we talk about human rights, one of, the most, one of the most basic rights that we have as human beings, as citizens of this country, is the ability to provide for yourself. And if you cannot provide for yourself, um, then we have all kinds of social distress. So that's the issue that, that I kind of want to push forward, that this is a basic, human right that anyone deserves the right to have a job and pay their own bills and buy their own groceries. So, um, formerly incarcerated people should not be discriminated against because they made a mistake or a bad choice five, 10, or 15 years ago. Great, thank you so much. Um, now I want to move on to um, Wallace. Um, Wallace, do you want to just sort of talk for a few minutes about what does ban the box mean to your typical person who was formerly incarcerated? What does it mean for them? What ban the box means to formerly incarcerated individuals is this. It gives an, an opportunity to interview and talk about who they are. You know, not necessarily that's not put a lot of emphasis on what my crime was, but what validates me as a person. You know, personally, what validates me as a former incarcerated person is that little girl that's sitting over there, that's my daughter. That's part of the things that validate me. Part of what I, you know, what a person brings to the table, those soft skills. So basically, you know, Band of Box is not a silver bullet. It does not guarantee employment. You know, I must be qualified for that particular position that I am applying for. So what Band of Box has done is allow us to be able to have that interview allow us to get in, get to know who I am as a person and what I'm bringing to the table. Great, thank you so much. Um, and now I, I want to turn it over to Kay, who's going to talk a little bit um, about the enforcement process. As I said, this is um, a piece of legislation, it's an ordinance, it was passed by Philadelphia City Council. Um, it is enforceable, employers have to comply with this. Um, so, they have to, so, so they have to comply, then it means ones that do not comply with it, you know, there are repercussions for that. Um, so I want to turn it over to Kay to sort of talk a little bit about the process that's, that's set up for enforcement. Okay. Thanks, Carrie. So as uh, was discussed in the, the video, um, approximately one-fifth of our population has a criminal record of some sort. Um, these are uh, disproportionately uh, African-American and Latino males. So that's really why the mayor asked um, us at the Philadelphia Commission on Human Relations to be the enforcement agency for Ban the Box. What we do is we enforce the city's anti-discrimination laws, our civil rights laws. And so we include protected categories that um, uh, cover race and ethnicity uh, among 16 other protected categories. I am very proud to say that we offer greater protections at the city level than either at the state or federal level. And so uh, we, have, we take claims in the areas of employment, um, pu public accommodations, uh, housing, and real property, and now for ban the boss as well. So the, the process that uh, we have established for people to bring um, complaints, what we have is a, a process. And before I describe the process, let me just point out that um, the Band the Box covers private employers who have 10 employees or more. So that's the that's first requirement. There's also an exemption. Um, employers that are considered criminal justice agencies are exempt from the law. So if, if there are court systems or um, law enforcement agencies, they, they are not covered by, by Man the Box. So 
about the, um, uh, the, the process, um, if there is someone who um, feels that they have seen um, a violation of Band the Box, and that we'll talk about two different um, uh, sort of situations. One is when there is uh, the, the question that's asked about criminal records on an employment application. So that's one situation. And then there's another situation because in addition to banning the box on paper, uh, employers are not allowed to ask questions about criminal records during the first interview. Okay. So um, those are two different ones, but what, we have one complaint form that is available on our website. And it is also, if you come to our offices um, at the Curtis Center, uh, we can walk you through um, filling out a complaint form. So it includes all of the essential information as to, to the, you know, the details of what's covered under the law and what's a violation. So we are the enforcement agency. Um, there is a $2,000 penalty per violation um, that can be assessed against employers. So that, that is the, the, the potential penalty for a finding of a violation. What unfortunately is not available are remedies that go directly to an applicant. So what this law does is really target employer practices and set up a scheme of a, a penalty system to um, provide a, an added incentive for employers to comply, but there really is no direct remedy that goes to the complainant. So we have, we have this uh, process set up, it involves filling out the complaint form, and then as an initial matter, again, we're focused on trying to educate employers and for employers to change their practices. So what will happen is that upon a filing of the complaint, we will send out a uh, warning notice. It's a warning to the employers, uh, notifying them that we have information that they are violating man the box, and that puts them gives them an opportunity to correct their practice. So then they need to respond to us within 30 days and say how they've corrected the practice. And, and that's the initial system. If we either get no response from the employer or an inadequate response, then we will go to the next step of uh, setting up uh, a hearing for the matter, sending out a subpoena, and uh, having them come in with a notice of violation that we are sending out to them. Gives them an option to settle the matter in advance of the hearing um, for, by paying $1,500 of the, the $2,000. That's one way that they can get ram into the situation or they can come and again come to the hearing. Um, there will be something that looks like we will conduct what looks like a trial for us. There has to be at least one commissioner who um, hears the case and makes a decision, um, but at that point, uh, that's when we can uh, assess the, the penalty of $2,000. So, um, that's uh, briefly what the, the complaint process looks like. Great, thank you so much. Um, I just want to talk very, very briefly about what the next steps are and what everyone in this room can do to sort of help this process moving forward. Um, what everyone do is spread information about Ban the Box to your friends, your family, your community. Tell people you know what it is, also what it is not. In order to help you do that, there were a number of fact sheets that were developed. We actually have a bunch of them on the back table, um, all the back up there. And also make sure that um, attendees here can get electronic versions of them. Make sure Philadelphia Fight has that. So if you are an employer, take the box off your applications and also make sure that all of your employees who are doing interviews um, do not ask that question during the first interview. Um, if you are a nonprofit or a provider organization, feel free to share the information that's on that back table with your clients and also with other organizations within your network. Um, if you want your case managers or your job developers trained on how to talk to their employers or clients about that, we have people that are more than willing to come out and to train them on how to talk about this. Um, and then if you are an individual who is formerly incarcerated, um, share this information you know, with your friends and your family. And then if you're out there in a job search, either for your next your next job or if you're currently unemployed and if you see that there's a violation either with that box on the application 
or someone asked you during the first interview about your criminal background to complete a complaint form. Um, Katie said that the complaint form is on the commission's website. We also have a bunch of complaint forms that we have brought with us as well. Um, so that's a little bit about you know, what you guys can do um, to help make sure that everyone comes in compliant, you know, compliance with Ban the Box, and if they're not compliant, that they go through the process of either becoming compliant or being deemed being by leadership. brought to our commission. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, before we get to um, questions um, and answers, um, is there um, any other information that any of the panelists would like to um, add at this point? No, other than the electronic, maybe um, I know online there were some questions about the online um, applications that typically they shut off if you ask a question, but um, that's still technically a violation, and I know that uh, Kay can probably speak more to pursuing that, that type of violation. So you're talking about online application forms right. that are, yes, that, that is very much um, part of, of the, the application process that we would consider that. So it, it's not just paper, paper applications, it's um, online submissions, electronic submissions of employment applications as well. Okay, I just, uh, just encourage everybody that if you do see these, like, you have to report it. That's the only way that it's going to uh, be ratified is if you report it. Great. Um, thank you. Thank you all. Um, and just one more quick thing before we get into any questions from the audience is um, there were a lot of organizations and a lot of individuals that have spent a lot of time over a number of years working to get Ban the Box passed. And a lot of people on city council have supported it, members of the administration. There are a lot of work that has gone into getting us this point. So if everyone just give a round of applause for just all of those organizations that have been involved. Okay, so with that, um, we have time for some uh, questions. Hi, um, could you explain, I have two questions, Council. Could you explain to people what you mean by first interview does it have to be a face-to-face -face interview um, to be considered an interview and my second question is how do people how do people get their dockets so they know what's in them so that they already know what questions might come up in a second interview let me let me answer the first question um, so um, the first interview is any communication um, so it does not in person of course counts but it can be on the phone as well, so in person is not required. Um, and I'm not sure I understand um, your second question. You can, order you can order your own criminal record from the state repository, the state police, okay. and review it. Actually, it's, that's a great question because a lot of these companies, they're doing these online searches, and as you saw in the video, they're not that accurate. The best thing that you can do is get yours from the state police, and at that second interview, if you feel so inclined to disclose, then you can actually have some, you know, the facts about what you've been charged with. Because it's not just about the conviction that you may have served time for. It may have all of your arrests on there from things that, you know, that, exactly. And sometimes employers typically will, you know, get information that maybe that case was thrown out. And it shouldn't have appeared on, uh, on your docket. So it's good to just order from the state police. Let me add on to, to that. Um, the, the law, there, there are different kinds of criminal records and the law applies to different issues in different ways. And so um, for a conviction, that's what you cannot ask on the, the application and cannot ask about in the first interview. But there's a different rule for convict, you know, uh, sorry, arrests, arrests that are no longer pending. So if there was an arrest and there was no conviction, then employers cannot ask about that ever, ever. So um, that's not limited to the application process. It's they're not allowed to take uh, adverse employment action. They can't terminate you, can't, can't move you, they can't do anything um, to you because of a, an arrest that did not result in a conviction. Okay. Um, the hand right here. Yeah, um, in terms of using these online resources to check someone's, is there any way that we can monitor or check on if a company's actually doing that? Because you figure during the first application they can get your name, your address, and then they can go ahead and do that anyway, and then you go back and watch after the ISP. Mm -hmm. 
Is there a way to monitor that in terms of forcing it, or is that just kind of something you don't have access to? Well, I think that's a slippery slope. They might be better in terms from a legal perspective, but I think that if you have a suspicion, the best thing you, you may be able to do is get an attorney to have the record subpoenaed. Um, I don't know that there's a way to, to track the company's online movement to see what they order legally, but after the fact, you certainly can subpoena records if there's a reasonable suspicion, I'll say. I, you know, so it's kind of difficult to prove. And that can be part of the hearing process that we have. Uh, people can bring in evidence, and but that, that needs to be supplied by people. And I think that, that that's one of the, the difficulties of the, the enforcement piece for this is that that we really need people to come forward who are willing to share information. The application is pretty easy. If we can find it online or if there's a copy of it, we would love to get that so that we can take that into consideration. Um, when you get to a point where we're dealing with cases that involve the first interview, then we're going to need witnesses because it's necessarily a who said what during the, the interview process. And so uh, my suggestion for um, folks who are being interviewed is for them to take notes as they're, they're going through the process so that they can like say, but, but then it's ultimately a question of credibility. But we can consider, um, if, if it's available, the information like you're describing, if we can track uh, what an employer has done in terms of the electronic searches, and and you know, but drilling down to find that information, it, it can be difficult and costly. Um, but it, I suppose there can be also records that can come from the the background check um, side of things. So the, the, if there is an electronic record of what's being supplied, you know, we would take that into account as well. It's, it's, the hard part is, is getting at it and getting access to it and having it provided to us at the commission. Uh, are there any hands? I am sorry, the podiums are here. If I'm missing any hands, uh, ma'am, all in red shirt. We don't have anybody on the panel right now who, who is part of the expansion project. Um, is, but That's actually have... Wayne Jacobs. Do you know uh, the gentleman from ex Fitness for Community Power? And Wayne Jacobs, he was on the video. Um, I know they had the table set. They're probably gone by now, but we can certainly probably give you some contact information for them. They conduct a, uh, they conduct a, uh, an expungement clinic that walks you through that process. That's a little different from Ban the Box. But we can certainly connect you to Wayne Jacobs and his organization to get that it's expungement information. Yeah. Well, I just want to back on for me to address some of what Ms. Shelby just asked. But I know in a previous workshop, um, we were told about the AOPC. I forgot exactly what it meant, but I took some notes. It says information is publicly available sells the data to agencies that use it for employment data. Can any of you give any feedback on that? Like what he was asking, I mean, how do you know, how, how can one tell that uh, one of these agencies didn't give information to a employer to use against an applicant? What does that, does that relate to uh, what he was asking? Well, you know, like Rupa said, it's going to be very difficult for you to, you know, but you will know. You will know whether an employer, you know, checked on you previously by the questions that is going to be asking you, their tone, all those things are going to, you know, be clear indicators that there's something about your background that they have found out about. Um, you know, to really say, can we monitor that or can it be monitored, that's very difficult. That's very difficult. But you got to keep in mind that with this new law that's been passed, employers are getting savvy. There are certain ways that they're going to come at you. They're going to ask about your gaps in your employment history. And you got to remember, once you open that door during that first interview, then it's like fair game. So you have to be on top of your game as, as it pertains to interviewing. And we always encourage people to, to brush up on the interviewing techniques because employers are going to find ways to get around that to be able to answer that question. Can I add something to that question? Yeah. Mm -hmm. The other issue is you, you started saying at the beginning of your comment that it's actually public record 
The problem is we don't want people to discriminate against you because of that public record. So anyone at any time can find out anything about your criminal background. So our intent is not to provide an opportunity to hide that, right? We just want to get past that initial interview so that you can put your best foot forward, um, really speak to your experience, your education, your background, and sell yourself. At some point, there's a high probability that you're going to have to discuss your criminal background. The reality is we don't want that to prevent that initial opportunity for you to gain access to employment. So I don't want anyone to confuse the two. The reality is this is public information, so people can access it. Are they doing it unfairly? Are they doing it to deny you an opportunity? That's the question, as uh, Mr. Custis said. It's hard to monitor that when it's so easily obtained via the internet. But you can have a reasonable suspicion. You know, you know when, when someone has phrased the question a certain way, that gives you an indication that they know something. And that's when you may have to pull up some of those resources that Case mentioned, because it may be costly for you to get you know, the, the legal support team together to actually track that information down. Yeah, John in the back. Hello, my name is Brian from the Federal Government Planning Project. Um, I had a case where a gentleman, he was, he, he was incarcerated, right? He got his registered license to become a nurse. He became a nurse. And the state of New Jersey was, was, was trying to, was trying to take his license away from him as being a nurse. What, what, what suggestions would you give somebody like that? Like, say somebody went to school and they become certified in certain areas of skills, like, can register nurse, LPN, whatever, you know, um, and the state was trying to take his license away. Let me talk about another exemption under Ban the Box. And so I talked about the, the 10 employees or more and then um, criminal justice agencies. There's another piece of Ban the Box um, that talks about um, how it interacts with other state laws. And so there are a, a host of state laws that apply to what types of criminal background checks can be conducted. So the general one is that employers are, really, are required to only consider criminal background to the extent that it's relevant to the job that you're applying for. And I think that they did a pretty good job in the video explaining what that is. So um, that's the overall requirement. There are a number of other statutes that are more specific so that if you're giving care to um, children or if you're giving care to elderly, there are, are more rigorous um, requirements that, that are the other way, um, that require employers to, to ask about certain crimes. And they're usually listed. Unfortunately, they're, they tend to be very broad. So the, law, the list is long and there are different, many different types of offenses that are included. So ban the box does, does not supersede those laws. So those, um, you know, uh, are, are on the books. Uh, ban the box will not ov overcome that, those requirements. But ban the box is really about timing on, on convictions. Let's just focus on the convictions piece. Um, so it's a, it's a matter of, of, you know, getting the, the fair opportunity to, to prove that you're the person who's best qualified for the job. So it's about timing. And from our perspective at the commission, Unless the, the state or federal law requires that these inquiries be made on the application or during the first interview, our point is that you can comply with both. So you can um, you know, hold off on asking, you don't, don't ask on the application, you don't ask during the first interview, and then you deal with the, the requirements of other um, statutes um, around criminal convictions at, at a later time. So, but it, it, th those are expressly um, e exempt from ban the box. And, 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 and also, you know, we need to understand the nature of your charges will govern to what positions or what industries that you can partake in. You know, especially the healthcare field is going to be very, very difficult with any type of arrest, you know, or filling the conviction for you to kind of break into because of our pre existing laws. So, you have to, you know, kind of educate, you know, the people that you're working with to get a clear understanding of what the nature of the charges will, what they got, will govern, what career opportunities that they can pursue. Um, we got the signal that we have um, time for one more question. Um, we're gonna have to wrap up. Um, actually, we're gonna go with the gentleman here, in the, like the light blue shirt. 
I live in a neighborhood that's a high crime neighborhood. So I am thankful and grateful that we have police officers there that are doing their duty. The, you know, it, it's, it's real easy to say about this or that. In the city of Philadelphia, we have a district attorney that's taking measures so that, you know, people are not being charged in the same manner that they were previously. But again, the onus is on the individual. You know, uh, it, it, you know there's a simple way that we at RISE teach our participants. How do you stay out of prison? It's a real simple thing. Obey the law. So if I obey the law, then I, you know my likelihood of being you know picked up, being stopped, you know, are less. You know, so I, I mean, you know, when you talk about the front end, it, it, the front end starts with us, with the individual, not police, not police, you know, law enforcement, not with politicians. It starts with the individual. Okay, um, with that, um, I got the signal that we're going to have to wrap up. Um, so um, thank you, um, Ruben and Kane Wallace, for participating you know, with me on this. And thank all of you for, for coming. And um, can we just have another round of applause for all those who work together? And once again, um, don't forget there's plenty of fact sheets um, all the way in the back. And we'll make sure that Philadelphia Flight has uh, electronic copies as well. Thank mm -hmm. you.